Several years before the John Benet Ramsey case, America was trying to solve the mystery of the disappearance of seven-year-old Jacqueline Dovalibi. Was she abducted by a stranger who entered her home under the cover of night? Or did she become a victim within her own family? The police were convinced that the culprits were always in plain sight, whereas no one who knew the family doubted their complete innocence. Midlothian, located in the state of Illinois, USA, is a small town where everyone knows each other. It is situated approximately 30 minutes south of the bustling streets of Chicago and is considered a quiet suburb where there is always a sense of being in a familiar place. However, in 1988, the town changed forever when seven-year-old Jacqueline Dovalibi disappeared from her own bedroom in the middle of the night. Jacqueline lived in a cozy, ranch-style home with her parents, David and Cynthia, and her four-year-old brother, Davy. The family resided in a beautiful location, surrounded by several nature preserves, all within walking distance from their home. Jacqueline's biological father, Jimmy Guess, had no involvement in her life after a bitter divorce from Cynthia shortly after their daughter was born. David Dovalibi adopted Jacqueline when he married Cynthia five years ago when Jacqueline was two years old, and he was the only father she knew. Cynthia worked as a dietitian at the local hospital, and David was a carpenter who had been promoted to a foreman. David and Jacqueline had an instant connection, often going fishing and bowling together. According to one neighbor, whose daughter was friends with Jacqueline, she was a happy little girl who never showed any signs of sadness or anger. According to all accounts, the Dovalibis were a typical, close-knit suburban family. On the evening of September 10, 1988, Cynthia took Jacqueline and Davy to a nearby KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant, while David met up with his friends and went bowling. When all family members returned home, they watched television, and Jacqueline, wearing her favorite purple and white pajamas, kissed Cynthia and David goodnight. What exactly happened in the house that night remains unclear, but the next morning, the little brunette with brown eyes was no longer there. David and his son woke up earlier than the other family members on the next morning, and around 7.45, David noticed that the front door was slightly ajar. At first, he thought that his mother, who lived with the family, had left it open and didn't worry much about it. He prepared breakfast for Davy and turned on the television. A little later, Cynthia woke up and went to wake up their daughter but couldn't find Jacqueline in her bedroom. The parents called Jacqueline's friends, thinking that she might have gone outside to play. While they searched for the child inside the house and in the neighborhood, Cynthia noticed that the basement window was broken and wide open. David immediately called the police and reported his daughter's disappearance. After investigators arrived at the house, Cynthia and David explained that none of them had heard anything unusual during the night, and they had all been sound asleep. Nothing was missing from the house except Jacqueline's blanket, which matched the colors of her pajamas. Furthermore, there were no signs of a struggle. Investigators needed to determine whether someone had broken into the house and taken Jacqueline, or if she had left the house herself, only to be taken by someone else. Although there were no phone calls or ransom notes, the FBI agents took over the investigation, presuming that they were dealing with a kidnapping rather than a runaway case. Soon, the news of a possible abduction spread throughout the town. The suburb mainly consisted of families with young children, and the possibility that someone had broken into a family's home and abducted their little girl in the middle of the night while everyone was asleep was a horrifying revelation. Considering that there were no signs of a struggle, investigators began to wonder if the girl might have left with someone she knew. If the intruder had entered the house through the broken basement window, they needed to be familiar with the layout of the house to enter the girl's room without waking the other family members, investigators concluded. We are looking at it with an open mind as a potential abduction, but also as an abduction with someone known to the family, said police captain John Bitten. This statement led Cynthia to recall an unsettling incident that occurred several years earlier. After a bitter custody battle during which her former partner, Jimmy Guess, did everything in his power to keep their daughter with him, he had broken into their home and attempted to take their daughter. Therefore, Cynthia suspected his involvement in Jacqueline's disappearance because she knew he was capable of such actions. Jacqueline's grandmother, Anne Dovalibi, admits that she wasn't initially worried about her granddaughter's safety because she believed that Jacqueline had been taken by her biological father and she was confident they would quickly get her back. However, she couldn't have known that Jimmy had been in prison in Florida for the previous four months during Jacqueline's disappearance and was soon ruled out as a suspect. Suspicion also fell on Jacqueline's uncle, Timothy Guess, who lived nearby 
and suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. However, he had an alibi. It was at this point that Cynthia began to worry that something bad had happened to her daughter. The parents of the girl, Cynthia and David, were questioned multiple times in the following days. They didn't hide anything. They explained that Jacqueline had gone to bed at 10 p.m., and when Cynthia went to check on her at 11 p.m., she was sound asleep. The police became increasingly skeptical of the parents' story. It was difficult for them to believe that a person unfamiliar with the layout of the house could have crawled through the basement window without disturbing the towel dryer right beneath the window. Then, they would have had to walk down the hallway to the girl's room and take her away without waking any of the other family members. The only sign that a stranger had been in the house was the broken window. No fingerprints or signs of a struggle were found. Indeed, when it comes to fingerprints and other evidence, it's important to note that the police themselves made a series of mistakes that could have influenced their conclusions. They never secured the girl's room to prevent anyone from entering it, and they didn't thoroughly search the house. A forensic expert took photographs, but he didn't even bother to take close-up pictures of the broken window. He checked the window and the front door for fingerprints, but not the back door. What was even more astonishing was that the police allowed friends of the family to clean up their house and even sweep away the glass from the broken window. The police just stood by and watched as they cleaned up, destroying any evidence that the kidnapper might have left behind. Immediately after the girl's disappearance, Jacqueline's parents were asked to take a polygraph test. Cynthia was too distraught for such a test. Friends recall that she was in a terrible state, constantly feeling nauseous. David underwent the polygraph test, which he passed. But in the minds of the police, everything seemed to point to the parents. The number of potential suspects sharply narrowed after one of the forensic experts stated that, in his opinion, the basement window had been broken from the inside. On September 14th, five days after the girl's disappearance, the parents attempted to take a polygraph test again. Cynthia's results were inconclusive due to her emotional state. David's results were also inconclusive, and the polygraph examiner accused him of not cooperating with the investigation. David in turn claimed that the polygraph examiner instructed him to answer yes to all questions, including the question, did you kill your daughter? To which David refused to answer yes. Afterward, David was taken into an interrogation room and was not released for five hours. Later that evening, Michael Chapman pulled into the parking lot of the Islander Apartments on 1912 Canal Street in Blue Island, a town located about five kilometers from the girl's home. When Chapman exited his car, he noticed an unpleasant odor in the fresh autumn air. He spotted something wrapped up in the grass, which he described as a wrapped-up object. As he approached, he saw a head and a hand, and he immediately ran inside to call the police. Jacqueline's body was discovered, and she was still bound with a two-meter rope, which was considered evidence of the crime. Her soiled underwear was found about 60 centimeters from her body. As for the police, they continued to question Jacqueline's father for about one and a half hours without informing him that his daughter had been found. They tried to convince him to confess to the crime. When Officer Kevin Shaughnessy finally told him about Jacqueline's discovery, David didn't believe him, thinking it was another police trick to make him confess. This is likely why he responded with the phrase, I guess you think I should cry now? However, Officer Shaughnessy interpreted these words differently, and they convinced him not to pursue other suspects. In any case, there was no evidence against David, and he was released to go home where he found his distraught wife and realized that his daughter was truly gone. By morning, with the help of dental records, the body was officially identified as Jacqueline de Wallaby. Initially, based solely on the appearance of the body, there was speculation that she had been struck on the head, but the Cook County coroner, Dr. Robert Stein, stated that the condition of the body was the result of rapid decomposition due to the unusually warm September weather. Dr. Stein could not determine with certainty whether the girl had been sexually assaulted or not due to the state of decomposition. Although the exact time of death couldn't be determined either, Robert Stein concluded that she had been dead for several days, and the terrible crime was most likely committed early Saturday morning, right after her disappearance. After the body was identified, and given that they had been individually questioned for hours before Jacqueline was found, both Cynthia and David hired lawyers who advised them to invoke their Fifth Amendment rights and not answer any more questions from investigators. They had already told the police everything they knew, provided blood and urine samples, 
and gave permission for investigators to examine any family medical records that might be relevant. They also allowed investigators access to their home for all five days that Jacqueline was missing. The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution allows citizens to refuse to answer any questions that may incriminate them. The Dewalabis had every right to invoke the Fifth Amendment. However, with no other suspects, law enforcement focused their attention on Cynthia and David as the primary suspects and claimed that it was suspicious that they were not cooperating with investigators. Police rushed to accuse the family of refusing to cooperate with the investigation. Prosecutor Patrick O'Brien explained, even if you are being looked at as a suspect and you know deep down inside that you didn't do this and it's unfair, the idea of not cooperating with the police that are investigating the murder of your daughter seems overly concerned about your personal interests. On the day after the funeral, a team of 20 police officers executed search warrants at the Dewalaby home. They emerged from the house with several large bags containing items they wanted to examine in the laboratory. Additionally, they confiscated the family's blue Chevrolet Malibu. Months passed, but there were no updates or new information about the case. However, the police made a statement indicating that the family members had not been excluded as suspects. Cynthia's lawyer, Lawrence Hyman, criticized the police investigation, calling it a blatant violation of the law. While Cynthia and David continued to avoid communicating with the media, they had a multitude of supporters. Neighbors stood by the family telling journalists that the Dovalabis were a loving and caring family and they had never heard either of the parents raise their voice at Jacqueline or Davy. David's boss, Ross Patterson, recalled, The only time David took a day off work was when he needed to get documents for Jacqueline's adoption. However, this did not convince the investigators. Adhering to the theory that Cynthia and David could be involved in the crime, they returned to the location where the body was found and began showing photos of Cynthia, David, and their car to residents of the Islander Apartments, hoping to find any witnesses who might have seen them in the area. On November 22nd, Cynthia and David were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Their son, Davy, was placed under the care of the Department of Family and Children's Services. It became known that a tenant of the apartment complex where the body was found had told investigators that he had seen David in a blue Chevy Malibu in the parking lot. A witness, a 35-year-old city transportation worker named Everett Mann, said that around 2 a.m. on September 10th, he was pulling into the parking lot and his headlights illuminated a blue Chevy with a driver he claimed was David Dovalibi. During Cynthia and David's arrest, they were deliberately paraded in front of the media so that as many photos as possible could be taken, seemingly to convey the message, look, we've done our job. Detectives boasted about having a wealth of evidence against David and Cynthia, including two witnesses. However, it remained unclear why loving parents would act this way towards their daughter. Were there enough pieces of evidence? Or were the investigators rushing to take the case to court for some reason? Perhaps the answer to this question lies in the fact that on the same day as the parents' arrest, a major news story emerged. Richard M. Daly, the state's chief prosecutor whose office was handling the case, announced his candidacy for mayor of Chicago. Critics accused him of using a high-profile crime in his political game, but despite the criticism, Daly became the mayor of Chicago, and the case was handed over to the court. It is widely known that eyewitness testimonies are highly unreliable. Nevertheless, the witness statements suggesting that David was near the crime scene were enough to charge him and his wife with first-degree murder. Blue Island Police Chief Paul Greves referred to these witness testimonies as excellent evidence that allowed them to rule out other leads. The police never disclosed what those other leads were, but relying solely on witness testimony to exclude all other possibilities seemed somewhat prejudicial, especially considering that Cynthia was not linked to the crime scene. Both spouses were denied bail, and it was revealed that Cynthia was in the early stages of pregnancy. In the search for new evidence, the police decided to focus on the couple's five-year-old son, Davy, who was examined by a doctor. Supposedly, the doctor found traces on his body that could have resulted from a belt, some of which were old while others were recent. The police suspected that Cynthia and David had abused Davy at home, suggesting it could be a motive for the crime. 
Patrick Murphy, Davies' state-appointed guardian, said that the police and prosecutors continuously questioned the child for four days. He added that after speaking with Davy and reviewing his medical records, he couldn't understand how they arrived at such a conclusion because he couldn't find anything that indicated violence against the child. He also mentioned that Davy constantly pleaded to see his parents, and he missed them greatly. In mid-December, Cynthia and David were released on bail, but Davy was not allowed to return home with his parents. He was placed in the custody of David's sister Rose and her husband John. Davy was only allowed to see his parents during supervised visits. In April 1990, the court proceedings began. It became clear early on that the evidence gathered by law enforcement was not as compelling as initially reported. The prosecutors didn't even have a clear motive for the crime, but fortunately for them, they were not legally obligated to provide one. Their main argument was straightforward. There were no outsiders in the house, so the Dovalibis must be guilty. The defense argued that due to the poor police work, it was impossible to determine how the intruder had entered the house and what had transpired inside during that night. The idea that the intruder needed to know the layout of the house to find Jacqueline's bedroom seemed far-fetched. The family lived in a typical ranch-style house. Many such houses are built with a similar layout. Anyone who had ever been inside a similar house would likely know the layout. The prosecutors also tried to argue that the intruder had to navigate through a window without disturbing objects below, such as a vanity, a TV stand, and a towel rack. To demonstrate that this was possible, David filmed a video showing how a neighbor climbed through the basement window, propped his leg on the wall, and didn't disturb any objects below. Furthermore, it turned out that the prosecution had only one witness, not two. Everett Mann, the key prosecution witness, admitted during the trial that he had identified David solely by his prominent nose. He was about 70 meters away from the man in the parking lot and only remembered his distinctive nose, as it was dark and the lighting was quite dim. Moreover, during the photo identification, Everett was shown a frontal picture of David, while he had only seen the person in profile. Additionally, David's photo was much larger than the four photos of other men. Everett admitted that the person he saw that night could have been African-American or Caucasian, or even a man or a woman, and all he saw was a silhouette that only looked male. In a night without moonlight, three weeks into the trial, the jury members were taken to the same parking lot where Everett had supposedly seen David. They stood in the same spot under similar conditions as Everett. They could hardly see anything. In reality, they couldn't even notice a nearby garbage can, which was said to be near where the car was parked. Several neighbors of the Dova Libbies also contradicted the witness's account regarding the car. The defense lawyers built their case around the fact that a remarkably similar crime occurred in the same neighborhood about a year after Jacqueline's abduction. On September 2, 1989, Perry Hernandez broke into a home in Blue Island and kidnapped a six-year-old girl while her family slept. He entered by breaking a window and made his way inside without waking anyone. The man took the girl to a railroad bridge near the Calumet River, tormented her, and then allowed her to return home. This happened within a mile and a half of where Jacqueline was found. An interesting detail emerged. The girl Hernandez was living with at the time also owned a Chevy Malibu, and Perry often stayed overnight at her apartment. In fact, even on the night before Jacqueline's disappearance, Someone had entered another home in Midlothian. Erzabet Siki woke up in the middle of the night and thwarted an attempted robbery or abduction of her daughter. She identified the person she saw in her home that night as Perry Hernandez and expressed confidence that he intended to abduct her seven-year-old daughter, whom she found tightly wrapped in three towels, as if someone had intended to take her away. While this may seem like more than a coincidence, Judge Richard Neville stated that he did not consider this evidence and prohibited Cynthia and David's defense from presenting these facts in court. However, the little girl abducted by Perry Hernandez was invited to testify. She recalled that while she was with the kidnapper under the bridge, he held a rope, as if threatening her with it. Besides the striking similarities between the two cases, this demonstrated that a small child could indeed be taken from a bedroom without waking anyone. However, in court, the defense made a mistake by failing to establish a connection with the jury members. They wanted David to take the witness stand and firmly declare his innocence, looking them in the eye, but that didn't happen. The most significant obstacle for the defense 
turned out to be the 17 autopsy photographs and remains presented to the jury. The prosecutors claimed that the photos were meant to help determine the time and cause of death. The defense believed that these photos simply contributed to bias among the jury members. An attorney explains, you're shown a beautiful girl next to a photograph of her body. And of course the jury members thought someone must pay for this crime. However, the photos didn't convince the judge who dropped the charges against Cynthia because her only connection to the crime was being in the house. The judge ordered to keep his decision secret because David's fate still lay in the hands of the jury due to the testimony of Everett Mann. After 14 hours, the jury delivered their verdict, guilty. Everyone believed that David would be acquitted, and the media were already waiting for him outside the courthouse for interviews. It was a shock to everyone that he was found guilty. The judge sentenced David to 45 years in prison. Many didn't understand why the jury had no doubts about his guilt, but suddenly everything fell into place. In an interview with a reporter, the jury foreperson confessed why a guilty verdict was reached. It turns out that the jury saw photographs of the Dovalibi home. In one photo, the bedroom door of young Davy showed a dent from a fist, and the jurors believed this indicated David Dovalibi's violent nature. Coming to this conclusion, the jury members decided that there had been a lot of violence in the house. How wrong they were. The fist-sized dent had appeared long before David moved into the house with Cynthia and perhaps even before Jacqueline's birth. David's younger brother had struck the door with his fist when he was a teenager. The house belonged to David's mother, and the family always had more important things to spend money on, and the door was never replaced. Neither the defense nor the prosecution mentioned this dent, so the jury's decision was based on things that were not even discussed in court. The jury foreperson added that if they had their way, they would have accused Cynthia as well. During this time, Cynthia fought for custody of Davy. Several psychologists and social workers testified, stating that there was no hint that Davy had ever been mistreated, and Cynthia was a kind and loving mother who doted on Davy, and he on her. By mid-July, Davy was allowed to return home to his mother and his recently born sister, Carly Marie. The fact that the jury was biased against David needed to be used to challenge the verdict. Cynthia and the family's friends formed a committee to fight for David's release. One committee member offered a $10,000 reward for any information about the crime. Additionally, the committee allowed them to connect with people who could assist with the case. One of those people turned out to be Robert Byman, an attorney from the Chicago law firm Jenner and Block, who volunteered to work on the case pro bono. Initially, due to police statements, he also believed in David's guilt. But after studying the case materials, he realized there was no evidence against him at all. He understood that David was wrongly accused due to human nature. Byman explained, Twelve good and decent members of the jury were entrusted with deciding the fate of this case. Their choice was simple, to stand up and leave, saying, Sorry, Jacqueline, we can't do anything for you, or to convict the only person sitting before them. They chose the latter. In October, Robert Byman filed a petition for David's release based on new evidence. Gerald Bauman, a prisoner at Cook County Jail, claimed that he had overheard Perry Hernandez confess to the murder. However, after the petition was filed, Gerald refused to sign his previously given sworn statements, fearing for his safety, and claimed that he had received threats after news of this new evidence came to light. The appeal garnered such a significant response that, for the first time, the Illinois Appellate Court allowed video recording of the case proceedings. The Illinois Appellate Court had three options, uphold the guilty verdict, order a new trial, or completely exonerate David, which would mean he could never be tried for this case again. Five months later, the court's decision was announced, complete exoneration. The court ruled that the chief witness's testimony had been inaccurate and unreliable and the prosecutors had failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that David was the only person with the opportunity to commit the crime. The judges noted that all the basement windows had been left unlocked that night, and any of them could have allowed the perpetrator inside, but unfortunately they were not checked for fingerprints. They also criticized the decision to show the jury 17 gruesome body photographs that were unnecessary. On November 13, 1991, after spending 18 months in prison, David walked free. I've been a lawyer for almost 30 years, and in all that time there have only been three times when I was as happy as I was the day I walked David Dovalibi out of prison. 
Our judicial system is designed to work in 95% of cases. This time the system failed. It convicted an innocent man, said Robert Byman. However, the Dovalibi family was about to experience yet another shocking turn of events in one of the most paradoxical and unusual murder sagas in modern Chicago history. It became known that Rob Warden and David Protes, who were writing a book about the case titled Gone in the Night, had discovered a new potential suspect. Timothy Guess was a 31-year-old brother of Jacqueline's biological father. Timothy had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and lived in a house with his mother not far from Jacqueline's home. Initially, he claimed to have been working at the Park Avenue restaurant in Harvey on the night of the murder, and three restaurant employees confirmed his alibi. However, now two of them had recanted their statements. At least five regulars of the establishment also claimed that Timothy wasn't there that night. Warden and Protes spoke to Timothy, who told them that he often heard voices in his head and suffered from memory lapses. He told them that he was guided by a spirit, and this spirit had allowed him to describe the layout of the Dovalibi house, even though he had never been inside. He could even describe how to get to Jacqueline's bedroom. Timothy described the blanket in which the body was wrapped and somehow knew that the light in the bedroom was off on the night of her disappearance. However, Timothy was never seriously considered a suspect even after this information came to light. He passed away in 2002. Protests said, I felt that the case was solved, but I never thought anyone would be held accountable for the crime. The state would be too embarrassed to admit they had wrongly accused Cynthia and David. Since then, the Dovalibi family has moved and changed their last name due to the excessive attention on their lives. They still hope that Jacqueline's murder will be solved. Something terrible happened in that ranch-style home in Midlothian, Illinois, on the night of September 9, 1988. But three decades later, there are still no answers as to what exactly transpired. While the local police claim the case is open, there are evidently no leads being pursued. Every U.S. citizen has the right to invoke the Fifth Amendment, but when Cynthia and David exercised that right, they found themselves at the center of a wrongly and negligently conducted investigation.